Orthogenesis. Orthogenesis, also known as orthogenetic evolution. According to the theory, the largest scale trends in evolution have an absolute goal such as increasing biological complexity. Prominent historical figures who have championed some form of evolutionary progress include Jean Baptiste Lamarck, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and Henry Bergson. The term orthogenesis was introduced by Wilhelm Hockey in 1893 and popularized by Theodore Eimer five years later. Proponents of orthogenesis had rejected the theory of natural selection as the organizing mechanism in evolution for a rectilinear model of directed evolution. With the emergence of the modern synthesis, in which genetics was integrated with evolution, orthogenesis and other alternatives to Darwinism were largely abandoned by biologists. But the notion that evolution represents progress is still widely shared. The evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer made the term effectively taboo in the journal Nature in 1948 by stating that it implied some supernatural force. The American paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson 1953 attacked orthogenesis, linking it with vitalism by describing it as the mysterious inner force. Modern supporters include E. O. Wilson and Simon Conway Morris, though many museum displays and textbook illustrations continue to give the impression that evolution is directed. The philosopher of biology Michael Roos notes that in popular culture evolution and progress are synonyms. Definition The term orthogenesis from ancient Greek, orthos, orthos, straight, and ancient Greek, Genesis, Genesis. Origin was first used by the biologist Wilhelm Hockey in 1893. Theodore Eimer was the first to give the word a definition. He defined orthogenesis as the general law according to which evolutionary development takes place in a noticeable direction, above all in specialized groups. In 1922, the zoologist Michael F. Geyer wrote, Orthogenesis has meant many different things to many different people, ranging from a mystical inner perfecting principle to merely a general trend in development due to the natural constitutional restrictions of the germinal materials or to the physical limitations imposed by a narrow environment. In most modern statements of the theory, the idea of continuous and progressive change in one or more characters due according to some to internal factors, according to others to external causes evolution in a straight line seems to be the central idea. According to Susan R. Schrepfer in 1983, orthogenesis meant literally straight origins or straight line evolution. The term varied in meaning from the overtly vitalistic and theological to the mechanical. It ranged from theories of mystical forces to mere descriptions of a general trend in development due to natural limitations of either the germinal material or the environment. By 1910, however, most who subscribed to orthogenesis hypothesized some physical rather than metaphysical determinant of orderly change. In 1988, Francisco J. Ayala defined progress as systematic change in a feature belonging to all the members of a sequence in such a way that posterior members of the sequence exhibit an improvement of that feature. He argued that there are two elements in this definition, directional change and improvement according to some standard. Whether a directional change constitutes an improvement is not a scientific question, Therefore, Ayala suggested that science should focus on the question of whether there is directional change, without regard to whether the change is improvement. This may be compared to Stephen J. Goode's suggestion of replacing the idea of progress with an operational notion of directionality. In 1989, Peter J. Bowler defined orthogenesis as, literally, the term means evolution in a straight line, generally assumed to be evolution that is held to a regular course by forces internal to the organism. Orthogenesis assumes that variation is not random, but is directed towards fixed goals. 
Selection is thus powerless, and the species is carried automatically in the direction marked out by internal factors controlling variation. In 1996, Michael Roos defined orthogenesis as the view that evolution has a kind of momentum of its own that carries organisms along certain tracks. History. Medieval. The possibility of progress is embedded in the medieval great chain of being with a linear sequence of forms from lowest to highest. The concept, indeed, had its roots in Aristotle's biology, from insects that produced only a grub, to fish that laid eggs, and on up to animals with blood and live birth. The medieval chain, as in Ramon Lull's Ladder of Ascent and Descent of the Mind, 1305, added steps or levels above humans, with orders of angels reaching up to God at the top. Pre-Darwinian The orthogenesis hypothesis had a significant following in the 19th century when evolutionary mechanisms such as Lamarckism were being proposed. The French zoologist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck 1744-1829 himself accepted the idea, and it had a central role in his theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics, the hypothesized mechanism of which resembled the mysterious inner force of orthogenesis. Orthogenesis was particularly accepted by paleontologists who saw in their fossils a directional change, and in invertebrate paleontology thought there was a gradual and constant directional change. Those who accepted orthogenesis in this way, however, did not necessarily accept that the mechanism that drove orthogenesis was teleological had a definite goal. Charles Darwin himself rarely used the term evolution now so commonly used to describe his theory, because the term was strongly associated with orthogenesis, as had been common usage since at least 1647. With Darwin, Roos observed that progress sick. His capitalization became essentially a 19th century belief. It gave meaning to life it offered inspiration after the collapse with Malthus's pessimism and the shock of the French Revolution of the foundations of the past. The Russian biologist Karl Ernst von Baer 1792-1876 argued for an orthogenetic force in nature, reasoning in a review of Darwin's 1859 on the origin of species that forces which are not directed so-called blind forces can never produce order. In 1864, the Swiss anatomist Albert von Kolliker, 1817-1905, presented his orthogenetic theory, heterogenesis, arguing for wholly separate lines of descent with no common ancestor. In 1884, the Swiss botanist Karl Nagely, 1817-1891, proposed a version of orthogenesis involving an inner perfecting principle. Gregor Mendel died that same year, Nagely, who proposed that an idioplasm transmitted inherited characteristics, dissuaded Mendel from continuing to work on plant genetics. According to Nagely, many evolutionary developments were non-adaptive and variation was internally programmed. Charles Darwin saw this as a serious challenge. Further, Darwin was himself somewhat progressionist, believing, for example, that man was higher than the barnacles he studied. Darwin indeed wrote in his 1859 Origin of Species. The inhabitants of each successive period in the world's history have beaten their predecessors in the race for life, and are, in so far, higher in the scale of nature, and this may account for that vague yet ill-defined sentiment, felt by many paleontologists, that organization on the whole has progressed. Chapter 10 as all the living forms of life are the lineal descendants of those which lived long before the Silurian epoch, we may feel certain that the ordinary succession by generation has never once been broken, and that no cataclysm has desolated the whole world. Hence we may look with some confidence to a secure future of equally inappreciable length. 
and as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. Chapter 14 In 1898, after studying butterfly coloration, Theodore Eimer 1843-1898 introduced the term orthogenesis with a widely read book on orthogenesis and the impotence of natural selection in species formation. Eimer claimed there were trends in evolution with no adaptive significance that would be difficult to explain by natural selection. To supporters of orthogenesis, in some cases species could be led by such trends to extinction. Eimer linked orthogenesis to neo-Lamarckism in his 1890 book Organic Evolution, as the result of the inheritance of acquired characteristics according to the laws of organic growth. He used examples, such as the evolution of the horse, to argue that evolution had proceeded in a regular single direction that was difficult to explain by random variation. Good described Eimer as a materialist who rejected any vitalist or teleological approach to orthogenesis, arguing that Eimer's criticism of natural selection was common amongst many evolutionists of his generation, they were searching for alternative mechanisms, as they had come to believe that natural selection could not create new species. 19th and 20th century Numerous versions of orthogenesis see table have been proposed. Debate centered on whether such theories were scientific or whether orthogenesis was inherently vitalistic or essentially theological. For example, biologists such as Maynard M. Metcalf, 1914, John Merle Coulter, 1915, David Starr Jordan, 1920, and Charles B. Lippmann, 1922, claimed evidence for orthogenesis in bacteria, fish populations, and plants. In 1950, the German paleontologist Otto Schindulf argued that variation tends to move in a predetermined direction. He believed this was purely mechanistic, denying any kind of vitalism, but that evolution occurs due to a periodic cycle of evolutionary processes dictated by factors internal to the organism. In 1964, George Gaylord Simpson argued that orthogenetic theories such as those promulgated by Du Naui and Sinat were essentially theology rather than biology. Though evolution is not progressive, it does sometimes proceed in a linear way, reinforcing characteristics in certain lineages, but such examples are entirely consistent with the modern neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. These examples have sometimes been referred to as orthoselection, but are not strictly orthogenetic, and simply appear as linear and constant changes because of environmental and molecular constraints on the direction of change. The term orthoselection was first used by Ludwig Hermann Plate and was incorporated into the modern synthesis by Julian Huxley and Bernard Wrench. Recent work has supported the mechanism and existence of mutation-biased adaptation meaning that limited local orthogenesis is now seen as possible. Theories For the columns for other philosophies of evolution, i.e., combined theories including any of Lamarckism, mutationism, natural selection, and vitalism, yes means that person definitely supports the theory, no means explicit opposition to the theory, a blank means the matter is apparently not discussed, not part of the theory. The various alternatives to Darwinian evolution by natural selection were not necessarily mutually exclusive. The evolutionary philosophy of the American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope is a case in point. Cope, a religious man, began his career denying the possibility of evolution. In the 1860s, he accepted that evolution could occur, but, influenced by Agassiz, rejected natural selection. Cope accepted instead the theory of recapitulation of evolutionary history during the growth of the embryo, that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which Agassiz believed showed a divine plan leading straight up to man, 
in a pattern revealed both in embryology and paleontology. Koch did not go so far, seeing that evolution created a branching tree of forms, as Darwin had suggested. Each evolutionary step was, however, non-random. The direction was determined in advance and had a regular pattern orthogenesis, and steps were not adaptive but part of a divine plan theistic evolution. This left unanswered the question of why each step should occur, and Cope switched his theory to accommodate functional adaptation for each change. Still rejecting natural selection as the cause of adaptation, Cope turned to Lamarckism to provide the force guiding evolution. Finally, Cope supposed that Lamarckian use and disuse operated by causing a vitalist growth force substance, bathymism, to be concentrated in the areas of the body being most intensively used in turn. Cope's complex set of beliefs thus assembled five evolutionary philosophies, recapitulationism, orthogenesis, theistic evolution, Lamarckism, and vitalism. Other paleontologists and field naturalists continued to hold beliefs combining orthogenesis and Lamarckism until the modern synthesis in the 1930s. Status. In science, the stronger versions of the orthogenetic hypothesis began to lose popularity when it became clear that they were inconsistent with the patterns found by paleontologists in the fossil record, which were non-rectilinear richly branching with many complications. A hypothesis was abandoned by the mainstream of evolutionists when no mechanism could be found that would account for the process, and the theory of evolution by natural selection came to prevail. The historian of biology Edward J. Larson commented that, at theoretical and philosophical levels, Lamarckism and orthogenesis seemed to solve too many problems to be dismissed out of hand, yet biologists could never reliably document them happening in nature or in the laboratory. Support for both concepts evaporated rapidly once a plausible alternative appeared on the scene. The modern synthesis of the 1930s and 1940s in which the genetic mechanisms of evolution were incorporated, appeared to refute the hypothesis for good. As more was understood about these mechanisms, it came to be held that there was no naturalistic way in which the newly discovered mechanism of heredity could be far-sighted or have a memory of past trends. Orthogenesis was seen to lie outside the methodological naturalism of the sciences. By 1948, the evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer, as editor of the journal Evolution, made the use of the term orthogenesis taboo. It might be well to abstain from use of the word orthogenesis. Since so many of the geneticists seem to be of the opinion that the use of the term implies some supernatural force. With the rise of evolutionary developmental biology in the late 20th, early 21st centuries, however, which is open to an expanded concept of heredity that incorporates the physics of self-organization, ideas of constraint and preferred directions of morphological change have made a reappearance in evolutionary theory. For these and other reasons, belief in evolutionary progress has remained a persistent heresy, among evolutionary biologists, including E. O. Wilson and Simon Conway Morris, although often denied or veiled. The philosopher of biology Michael Roos wrote that some of the most significant of today's evolutionists are progressionists, and that because of this we find absolute progressionism alive and well in their work. He argued that progressionism has harmed the status of evolutionary biology as a mature, professional science. Presentations of evolution remain characteristically progressionist, with humans at the top of the Tower of Time in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. While Scientific American magazine could illustrate the history of life leading progressively from mammals to dinosaurs to primates and finally man, Roos noted, that at the popular level, progress and evolution are simply synonyms, as they were in the 19th century, though confidence in the value of cultural and technological progress has declined. 
in popular culture. In popular culture, progressionist images of evolution are widespread. The historian Jennifer Tucker, writing in the Boston Globe, notes that Thomas Henry Huxley's 1863 illustration comparing the skeletons of apes and humans has become an iconic and instantly recognizable visual shorthand for evolution. She calls its history extraordinary. Nobody, Tucker observes, supposes that the monkey-to-man sequence accurately depicts Darwinian evolution. The origin of species had only one illustration, a diagram showing that random events create a process of branching evolution, a view that Tucker notes is broadly acceptable to modern biologists. But Huxley's image recalled the great chain of being, implying with the force of a visual image a logical. Popular perception, however, had seized upon the idea of linear progress. Edward Lindley Sanborn's Man is But a Worm, drawn for Punchy's Almanac, mocked the idea of any evolutionary link between humans and animals, with a sequence from chaos to earthworm to apes, primitive men, a Victorian bow, and Darwin in a pose, that according to Tucker recalls Michelangelo's figure of Adam in his fresco adorning the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. This was followed by a flood of variations on the evolution as progress theme, including the New Yorker's 1925 The Rise and Fall of Man, the sequence running from a chimpanzee to Neanderthal Man, Socrates, and finally the lawyer William Jennings Bryan who argued for the anti-evolutionist prosecution in the Scopes trial on the state of Tennessee law limiting the teaching of evolution. Tucker noted that Rudolf Franz Zallinger's 1965 The Road to Homo Sapiens fold-out illustration in F. Clark Howell's Early Man, showing a sequence of 14 walking figures ending with modern man, fitted the paleoanthropological discoveries not into a branching Darwinian scheme, but into the framework of the original Huxley diagram. Howell ruefully commented that the powerful and emotional graphic had overwhelmed his Darwinian text. Sliding between meanings. Scientists, Roos argues, continue to slide easily from one notion of progress to another. Even committed Darwinians like Richard Dawkins embed the idea of cultural progress in a theory of cultural units, means that act much like genes. Dawkins can speak of progressive rather than random. Trends in evolution. Dawkins and John Krebs deny the earlier Darwinian prejudice that there is anything inherently progressive about evolution, but Roos argues the feeling of progress comes from evolutionary arms races which remain in Dawkins's words by far the most satisfactory explanation for the existence of the advanced and complex machinery that animals and plants possess. Roos concludes his detailed analysis of the idea of progress, meaning a progressionist philosophy, in evolutionary biology by stating that evolutionary thought came out of that philosophy. Before Darwin, Roos argues, evolution was just a pseudoscience. Darwin made it respectable, but only as popular science. There it remained frozen, for nearly another hundred years, until mathematicians such as Fisher provided both models and status, enabling evolutionary biologists to construct the modern synthesis of the 1930s and 1940s. That made biology a professional science, at the price of ejecting the notion of progress. That, Roos argues, was a significant cost to people biologists still firmly committed to progress as a philosophy. Facilitated variation. Biology has largely rejected the idea that evolution is guided in any way, but the evolution of some features is indeed facilitated by the genes of the developmental genetic toolkit studied in evolutionary developmental biology. An example is the development of wing pattern in some species of Heliconius butterfly, which have independently evolved similar patterns. These butterflies are Mullerian mimics of each other, so natural selection is the driving force, but their wing patterns, which arose in separate evolutionary events, are controlled by the same genes.